13th at 6 p.m. There will be a Hyphen Connect on September 24th. Hyphen, make plans now to attend. Our annual church fish fry will be Sunday, September 26th. We look forward to this each year and anticipate a great day of food and fun.
This song is not written from somebody who's already been victorious and because of it I lift my hands. But if you've come into this house chained, shackled, bound with anything in your mind, anything in your physical body, he says he's victorious and I am victorious. And it is, how am I victorious? By releasing my praise. So I want to encourage you today as we sing this again, if you just begin to lift your hands to God, those shackled, heavy, chained hands, as you begin to raise them to the to the one true and living God, those chains are going to snap, and you're going to be set free. Hallelujah! God is in this house. God is in this house right now. Somebody free! If you'll lift your hands, lift your voices right now. Come on, get your hands up! Hallelujah! If you've got a situation in your life. If there is anguish, whatever it be, go ahead and lift your hands and your voice God, and let him snap those
can I want you to lift your hands right now. I want every eye closed in here and just begin to engage the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you get the presence of God right now in your life? God is here to do a deep work today. He wants to move. Oh, hallelujah. Would you get your head back and say, God, I need you. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, break some things in my life today. God, I've got good time to move into a season of prayer. If you've got a need, why don't you come on forward as they put some needs on the board. We're going to continue to sing and worship. We're believing that God is breaking chains in this house. And if you've got a need, come on forward. They'll anoint you with oil. And we're going to pray the prayer of faith over you. And Jesus is going to touch your mind. He's going to touch your heart and your knee. As the church prays together for the needs down here, let's lift our voices.
take a push. I want to encourage you to step out of the aisle right now. Come on, I need your church to get out of the aisle. Come on, God is here and he's ready to do something. I feel it within me. We're going to respond to this. We're going to dig in a little deeper. Push past the veil, church. Come on, River, push past that veil right now. There's a break he's coming. It's here. We've got to get engaged. Come on, I'll never be the same. last night and there was a foreigner that asked me in the dream, he said, why does the best church pray like we do? And the response out of my mouth was, we're too blessed. How ironic does that sound? We've got it good, we've got freedoms over here, but I want you to lift your hands and your voice right now and begin to pray and thank God for the freedoms that we have. And then let that prayer turn into a prayer for the folks and the situation going on over there. They need mercy over there. 
them. They need the spirit of mercy to move in. Come on, God's spirit is bigger than what's going on over there. And we as the church have the power to lift our voices and come on the scene for that, that situation. Come on, church, act like it's your own child. There are women and children over there that are being abused. There are Christians that are not breaking and they're dying because of their, their profession of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody lift your voice. Oh, somebody lift your voice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's your voice, it's your prayer, it's your prayers that can make it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's your prayers that make the difference. It's in your of the Lord. Lift your hands right now. Thank you for his presence. Oh, no other place I'd rather be. your voice and thank him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The world wants to silence our praise. That's right. That's the bigger, the bigger thing about that mask. We're not going to be silenced. We're going to lift our voice to God. Hallelujah. I'm not ready to move on. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is here. Will somebody just lift up your voice right now? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. up your voice and thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. You can be seated. They're coming to serve you. Ask Brother Browder if you would pray over this.
Jesus. May God bless you. You can be seated this morning. We're going to sing one more song before we go to the word of the Lord today. But I'm thankful for everyone that's in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Indeed, I'm glad everybody's here. Ed Prater and Olivia, we're so glad y'all are with us today. Always an honor to see you. Serena, we're glad that you're here. Frank Salcida, God bless you, sir. We're happy to have you with us also. Billy England, good, good to see you at the river today. We're glad that you're here. And then others, I don't want to miss anybody. I'm glad my beautiful wife is back in the house today. I miss her being there. Amen. All those getting better and good reports coming in. Sister Kennedy's doing a little better this morning. Sister Butts is doing well. Sister Gray is doing well. I'm just going to believe God. I'm going to believe God. He's a good God. He's a miracle-working God. Amen. So let's worship with them as they sing another song. We prepare our hearts to go to the word of the Lord. In the world you and I live in, we need as much preaching as we can get. I need fresh bread off of, off of the altar of the Lord, out of the oven of the Lord every day. I need God to speak to me, and I know that we collectively need God to speak to us. So this, this is sincere. When they're, they're singing today, open your heart, open your spirit, and say, God, let it be fertile ground for the Word of God. Let it be good ground today that the seed can go to and begin to, to reproduce what you would have in our lives. Worship with them as they sing. The Lord is my shepherd.
One of the greatest comforts you have today is knowing that you're not alone. You're not alone. In your most isolated moment, you are never, ever alone. You're never alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just stand together for the reading of the word of the Lord. trusting God to do a great work in this house today in people's lives. If I didn't believe that God could change lives, if I didn't believe that God could fill this house with his presence and do something for someone over here and someone back there and someone over here, then I would be one of the most foolish human beings that's ever lived to take my time and my effort and to prepare something to preach to the church that I think God wants them to hear. If I didn't think it would be effective, if I didn't think God had that power, then I will have wasted several hours this last week. But I know that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Going to the book of Mark chapter 5 today, beginning to read in verse number 24. Then we'll go to John chapter 10 and read one verse, verse number 10. Mark 5 and 24, and I'm going to tell you, I've preached from this passage several times in my ministry, but never quite the way that I will today, the way that the Lord give, gave this to me today for this. It's what we would call, again, a familiar passage to many among all of the miracles that Jesus did. This one is incredibly astounding. But Mark chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus went with him, speaking of John, and he would take, called him to come to his home. Much people followed him and thronged him. They pressed in on him. They surrounded him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And notice this. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, not while coming through the crowd. Not while laying at home sick. But at that moment she pressed her way in and came into contact with him. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, he turned him about in the press, looking through the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging me, and you're asking who touched you? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing not what was done in her, not understanding what had just happened, she came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Here's my life story. Here's the problem I had, and here's what happened. He said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. It's not going to be there when you leave the crowd. It's not going to be there when you get back home. It's not going to be there tomorrow. You're going to be whole of your plague. John 10 and 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have a life and that they might have it more abundantly. Not just life, but more abundant life. The help of the Lord, I want to minister for thought today. It's a blood issue. It's a blood issue. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? Lift your voices. Come on, lift your voices strong to the Lord. We need an anointing of the Holy Ghost today. We need a touch of God today. And there are people here today that desperately need God to move in their life. They're depending on a church to pray. They're looking for an intercessor to stand in the gap. And God, here we are today praying that heaven would touch her. Praying that the word of God would come alive today through the anointing of a messenger, God. 
that your will would be done. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. I don't know about you. It's going to be transparent here for the beginning. Every day I kind of wake up and hope things are different. I really do. I wake up and say, God, let today be different. Because it's just wearying what we've been going through. It's just kind of tiring. It's very, very taxing on us because we're living, or at least we're attempting to live, in a broken and hurting world. The national economy is affecting the local economy, which in turn affects our personal economy. It all trickles down and it shows up at our house in our bank account. The political unrest that's going on right now is enough to make anyone anxious, or it ought to be making you anxious. You ought to be a little bit nervous about what's going on in the world. It's just what's happening in the world. So I wake up every day and I say, God, let it be today that today just different. I want to say sometimes, God, let me turn the hands of time back. And I don't know how far back I'd want to go now because I don't even know if the good old days were really the good old days. You know, how far back do we go? It's just the way that it is. And we're, we're living in a messed up world and people are hurting. And that has been impressed upon me so much this week, day after day after day, that there are people struggling all around us and people are hurting and people even here in the church that are hurting right now and going through things and dealing with things that they have never dealt with before, having to, to work through issues and problems and situations. Each year in the USA, approximately 42 million people seek mental health counseling. 42 million people looking for somebody saying, I need help with my mind that I can't get my thoughts under control. I can't tell what's going on in my mind. 40 to 50% of all marriages in America will end in divorce. That statistic has stayed the same for decades now. Last year, 544,000 Americans filed for bankruptcy, telling you it's a hurting world. In 2020, 138 people per day died by suicide. Last year, 1.4 million people in the U.S. tried to end their own life. 424,000 kids in the foster care system because they've been removed from their homes. They're not with their parents anymore because of situations and decisions parents made. 32 million people in the United States over the age of 12 battle some form of drug addiction. It's a hurting world. It's a broken world. It's people looking for answers, people looking for a way out, people looking for a way to escape the pain. Right now, we're all enduring a pandemic, the likes of which none of the world have ever seen. None of us have ever experienced it in our lifetime. And I guess what is with every passing, the last week, two people I know, last 10 days, two people I know lost their lives due to COVID. So each of us know people that we have lost during this time, during this virus that's running rampant throughout the world. I'm going to be honest with you, the sense of loss and heaviness sometimes can be overwhelming. It can really be weighty on a person. that they got this issue, this problem, these things that are just one thing after the other, one situation after the other. I'm dealing with people on a regular basis right now, as in daily, every day, right now that are hurting. Situations in their life, I'm dealing with talking to people, phone calls, texts, messages marriage issues and health issues and financial issues and church problems that ministers are having and people are having and all of this thing going on, one hurt after another, being exposed, looking for some type of relief, looking for the pain just to end. Folks, I said, I'm going to say it again, we are living in a hurting world and the world is trying to self-diagnose and self-heal. It's trying to figure it out on its own. People all around me, they, they call, but then they say, well, here's what I think I'm going to do, or, or here's an idea that I have, or here's what somebody else said, or here's what a book said, or here's what I heard on the radio, or here's what I read on the Internet, or I Googled it, and, and the world's trying to self-diagnose and self-heal. But frankly, can I tell you, it's not working. It's not working. We're not getting any better. The hurt isn't going away. The pain isn't leaving lives. It's still there day in and day out. And in fact, instead of getting better, the world is getting worse. Many people's lives, instead of getting better, it gets worse day by day by day. Every moment that passes, it's a little bit worse. We look at the background of our text in the book of Mark, that, I, that passage that I read. This story begins in a rather common Middle Eastern village named Capernaum. 
This was a town that had dark igneous rock houses. It was not a pretty little town at all. It was not a town of affluence by any means. The houses were made of rock. The streets were incredibly narrow. It was located on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The story picks up for us, and some of the things that you find when you read the other Gospels, it's a story that appears in all of them, that, but the people of the town were out and about, and as they heard about the special powers that Jesus had, as they heard about his ability to do the miraculous, they began to find him and, and flock to him. They came from villages all around when you study it out. They, they, they found themselves in Capernaum, and the crowd is Larger and larger and larger till he gets to be quite a significant size. Most likely, the crowd was made up mainly of men and perhaps a few boys who had squeezed in among the adults. If there were women and girls present because of the culture of the day, they most likely were not in the center of the crowd. They were not the ones that were close to Jesus because in that day, women typically hung back on the edges or on the fringe. It was the men that would congregate and the men that had that privilege, if you will. It was into this crowd, tightened by the narrow streets they were moving through, this crowd pressing on Jesus and thronging him. It's into this situation that this woman plunged herself into the story. Now, according to Mosaic law, an open running sore on any kind, of any kind made a person unclean. If you had a sore on your body that was running, a bloody discharge at all, you were considered unclean and you would be put outside for seven days to be purified before you could come among people again. And under Leviticus 15, you know that anyone that touched an unclean person, or if you reached out and touched somebody and you were unclean, they became as unclean as you were and would have to be separated. So it is very reasonable to, under, to assume and understand that at this time of her life, this woman had most likely had contact with very few people, including her own family members. No one would have invited her over to their home for dinner. No one would have said, hey, let's get together for a time of coffee and conversation. The family reunion may have happened, but she wouldn't have been invited. The neighborhood may have had a community yard sale. She wouldn't have been asked to be involved. She was isolated. She was alone. She wouldn't have been at any festivals or celebrations. I'm going to tell you the loneliness would have been overwhelming. The pain and the hurt of solitude had to be a heavy weight in her life. Forget the physical affliction she had. Forget the issue of blood she was dealing with to be isolated from people and know that I can't even go out and be with my family. I can't hug my mama. I can't be at the family reunion. Had to be an incredible thing to deal with day in and day out. As the story unfolds, we know that she plunges herself into the crowd and no doubt she touches people on the way, making them unclean. We almost forgive her for that when we understand the story. In fact, most of those she touched probably didn't even have any idea. They had just been made ceremonial unclean. They just know that she had moved her way in and she had, excuse me, sir, pardon me, little boy, would you get out of the way? She's touching different ones, making them unclean, and they may not have any idea what had just happened to them. And honestly, it's rather amazing when you think about it. And as I read this story this week, it finally, it jumped out at me, and, and I'll explain in a moment, a little bit of righteous indignation rose up in me. When I read exactly what was going on and what was happening, I got a little bit irritated in a godly way. I said, that's just not right. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, think about this. The very thing that was supposed to be giving her life was taking life from her. The very thing that should be empowering her was causing her to become weaker. The very thing that should be giving her the strength to engage in the world around her was forcing her into isolation far away from the world. It was a blood issue. She had a blood issue. And that blood issue, that blood should have been life in her, but the blood was weakening her. The blood should have made her a part of life, but the blood was separating her from society. The blood was isolating her and making an outcast out of her. And I got to tell you, I have a major problem with that scenario. I have a major problem with that going on in her life. 
There's something I find in Scripture that makes this a bit difficult to accept because Leviticus 17.11 specifically says, life of the flesh is in the blood. The life is in the blood. It's the blood that carries the necessary oxygen through the body to enliven cells and tissues and organs. The breath of life is dependent on the blood of life. And this woman has a blood issue that is taking the very breath of life away from her. There was something going in on in her body that was robbing her of her strength. What was going on in her body was robbing her of her joy. What was going on in her body was robbing her of her happiness and her reason to live. What should have been giving her life was actually working against her. What should have made her feel alive made her feel like she was dying every day. What should have coursed through her body and made people want to be around her had turned on her and had made her an outcast. The blood, the blood was not in the body the way that it was supposed to be. So I can assure you today she was hurting. She was struggling. She was not only sick, but she was tired. She was alone. Her body was getting weaker and weaker. She wanted to be well. She didn't want to be sick. She didn't want to be an outcast. She didn't want to be isolated. She didn't want to spend her days at home by herself wondering if she would No, she wanted to be well. She wasn't sitting around having a pity party and just accepting her misery. No, she wanted things to be different. When you read the story, you find out even though there's a blood issue, she wanted life to be better. She wanted her problem to be solved. The Bible says she suffered many things because of the physician's not just one thing or two, but many things she went through because of the physicians. We only imagine how many cures she tried, how many remedies she took, how many doctor's offices she visited, how many hours she stood in line waiting to see somebody new, how, how many clinics inside of just to meet some new doctor that had some highly recommended cure. She went through it all day and day in and day out and day after day. Said that she spent all she had looking for a cure. Every resource she had, she expended it. She did everything she knew to do. She tried every answer that came along. Yet the Bible clearly says after all of her efforts, she grew worse. With every doctor, worse. Every herbal remedy, worse. Every supposed can't fail cure, worse. Every penny spent, worse. Every day spent waiting, worse. Can you imagine? Imagine living like that woman. Imagine being in that situation that no matter what you try, it only gets worse. You know what I think some of you can imagine? I think some of you can relate to her. I think some of you do understand where she is because just like this woman, you have a blood issue. You got something going on in your life you got something going on in your world that is sapping the strength out of you, that is taking your joy away, that is isolating you from everybody around you. One thing after the next happening, something in your life that should be giving you the joy of life is robbing you of life itself. Sometimes we don't want to admit it. We just want to put the smile on them. We want to go through the motions and we just want to live life and say everything's okay and God is good and he is, but honey, you're still human. You still got weaknesses. You still have hurts. You still have pains. You still have blood issues, if you will. And I'm going to tell you, hurt drains us. Pain drains us. Sickness drains us. Loneliness and isolation will drain us. It'll take the energy right out of us. Broken relationships drain us. Financial hardships drain us. It just takes life out of us. And that life that we should be living, we're not living because we have this issue of blood. And like this woman, you want to be whole. I know you do. You want everything to be all right. And maybe like her, you've tried everything you know to try. You've talked to people until you don't have any words left and nobody else wants to listen. You've read books and listened to podcasts 
Maybe you even went to every doctor and specialist you know, but nothing seems to help. In fact, one thing after the other with every passing day, you're getting worse. Your situation's not getting any better. It's just worse day. Can I tell you that like this little lady in our story, if you're ever going to be made whole, you're going to have to rise above your hurt. You're going to have to get above your issue. And you're going to have to let something get a hold of you. It's I'm willing to fight for my healing. To fight to be whole. I would rather die trying than die alone. I would rather die making my way to him than die by myself. you got to fight for your healing to be healed. That woman with the issue of blood had to fight for it. As she stood there on the fringe of that crowd that day, she realized there are so many big men here and so many young men in this crowd. I don't know how I'm ever going to get to him. Look at me. I'm weak. I'm hurting. I'm drained. I don't have the energy. I can't move that much. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I know I can't stop now. There's something that rose up inside of her. She said, I got to do something. I you to notice she didn't receive her healing when she heard that Jesus was there that day. She didn't receive her healing when she got up off of her sick bed and stumbled out of her doorway into the crowd that was gathered that day. That's not when the healing came. She didn't get to her healing by just hoping that Jesus would notice her. She didn't get her healing by just saying, hey, over here, over here, over here, touch me. It didn't come through all of that. Luke says that as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. They were pressing so tight on him they could have crushed him physically. It was that large of a crowd. But her thinking is this. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get to him and touch his clothing, that's all I need. I don't need a one-on-one -on -one audience. I don't need a private conversation. I just got to get to him and touch him. How did she get through the press? How did she work her way through young men and older, stronger men? I'm going to tell you it's amazing what desperation and desire will do. When you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you really get sick of your situation. When you really get tired of your blood issue, when you really get tired of the things going on in your world that are taking all of your energy and all of your life, and you know that only God can help you, you will be amazed what spiritual desperation will do, what a spiritual desire will do. It will part the crowd. It will move every obstacle out of the way. It will drive you beyond your physical limitation. It will move you into places you thought impossible, but you've got to get desperate and your desire has to be strong enough that I've got to get to him. You know, I don't know for sure. Maybe she did reach out at a moment's time with desperate desperation. She lunged through the crowd to touch him and grab nothing but thin air. Because he had taken a step on, the crowd had moved him on, and she's holding nothing. What do you do now? Maybe you've never been there. I've been in the presence of God before, but I needed a touch of God. And I'm reaching out with everything I got, and I think I'm about to get it, and all of a sudden it's gone. What do you do then? Does she, what's she going to do? Does she just lay there and give up in her weakened state and die? Does she look back through the crowd back down across the street to her doorway and say, if I can just make it back home and I'll crawl back up on my bed and I'll live every day like I've already lived, is that what she ought to do? Or does she reach out one more time? Can she lay there and work up just enough strength to say, I've come this far by faith. I'm not going to give up now. It may take my last breath. When you're really desperate, you'll give your last breath. It may take what little reserve of strength I've got. When your desire is strong enough, you'll take that last reserve of strength. She had just enough to really believe it was possible. I can live a better life than what I'm living. My tomorrows can be better than my yesterdays. I can leave his presence whole when I came into it broken and hurting and weak. One thing is certain. If her blood issue was going to be taken care of, she was going to have to get into the presence of somebody who had power over the blood. If her blood issue was going to be resolved, the doctors couldn't fix it. The books couldn't fix it. The family couldn't fix it. If her blood issue was going to be taken care of, she had to get in the presence of somebody who had power over the blood. Can I tell you, there is no doctor or specialist alive that has power over the blood to make it live. 
but Jesus does. There's no counselor or therapist any in the, anywhere in the world that can change your situation like Jesus can. There aren't enough bankers on earth that can alter your financial situation like Jesus can. There aren't enough preachers in all the pulpits of the world that can make his word come alive in your life uh, like Jesus can. There's no one that can step up into your world and make a difference uh, like uh, Jesus can. I'm telling you, he wants to step into somebody's world today and change things, but you gotta get desperate. There has to be a desire. Would you stand with me this morning? The life is in the blood. Everybody say that. The life is in the blood. <laughs> True life, real living, are found in His blood. His blood. Some of you are just going through the motions of life right now. Life has come along with a left hook and a right uppercut. And you're just reeling and you're rocking. And it's like one pain after the other. You're trying everything you know to do and it just seems like it's getting worse and worse and worse. And this thing that's called life that ought to make you happy to be alive seems like it's conspiring against you and is actually just sapping strength out of you. Marriages that ought to be happy are falling apart. Homes that ought to be united together are being broken up. Lives that ought to be so in tune with God. Jobs that you used to love have become miserable. In John 10 and 10, Jesus said this. I've come to give you life. And life more abundantly. Let me put it in common every day. I've come to give you a better marriage. I've come to give you a better home. I've come to give you a better job. I've come to give you a better relationship with me. I've come to give you a better family. I've come to give you a better future. Why? Because life is in the blood. And he's come to give you life more abundantly. I wonder if there's anyone here. You want a more abundant life. You're tired of the pain. You're tired of the hurt. You're tired of being weak. Is there anyone that's willing to press through the crowd today and say, I got to touch him? Come on, that woman knew she was everyone unclean. Sorry for touching you with my problem. Sorry for bothering you with my circumstances. Hey, hear me today, sir. Hear me, ma'am. Make your way through the crowd. You won't make us unclean. You won't bother us. We just want you to touch him. Your issues will never make him unclean. In fact, when you touch him, his blood is stronger than your blood issue. His blood is stronger than what's going on in your world. Anybody want that more abundant life? Let it happen right now. Oh, he's about to take care of somebody's blood issue today. He's about to fix somebody's world today. How bad do you want it? How desperate are you today? Are you willing to fight for your life? Are you willing to fight for your home? Can you fight for your family? Can you fight for your marriage? Can you make your way through the crowd to where he is? Whatever it takes, Jesus. Whatever effort I have to give. lost inside of me oh you make all things new you make all things new I made all you I made all you you make all things new you make all things new I made And I want you to listen to me. I really want the Lord to help somebody today. 
And I'm not good at begging people to come and pray. I'm not good at trying to twist your arm and drag you to an altar. But I'm wondering if we open up just a little bit of space. We just ready to move back just a little bit, open a little bit of space. If there's anybody that can come and say, Pastor, I'm hurting. Things going on that I need God to fix. There's no shame in that. There's no embarrassment in that. What you're really saying is, I got this blood issue. I got this life issue. Keep living with it. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. But I got a feeling if I can touch him today, if I can just touch him, if I can touch him. Anybody want to, come on, if you've got a special need, if you really, you've been dealing with some things and you just need God to move in a special way, I want you to come right here to the middle. And I'm not going to take long here. I'm not going to beg anybody. But when you get desperate, when your desire gets strong enough, he'll turn around in the crowd and say, who touched me? Who touched me? Anybody really want to touch him today? Come on, is your family worth fighting for? Is your marriage worth fighting for? Is your life for today?
leave you with one last thing out of this story that stood out to me this time through. There are a lot of things that will try to keep you from his presence. There are a lot of things that will press into the crowd of your life and will surround him and try to push you out. You ever notice in this crowd that's pressing on him, that's crushing him, Nobody else's story is told except Jairus and this woman. The other thousands, we don't have any idea who they were. It's not uncommon out of thousands to only have two that are desperate. But those two will be remembered forever. We don't know if anybody else is, you know, he did miracles and all that. They were loaves and fishes people. They just wanted to see, wind Jesus up and let him go. But when you get desperate, he turns around in the crowd. They're pressing him. Hear me, when he turned around, he cleared some space. I need some room because I want to touch me because something just flowed out of me. You can touch God in a way, hear me, that you get the attention of heaven when you get desperate enough. Things don't crowd in on us. And can you imagine, she's already in pain and agony. But moving through that crowd, being kneed in the ribs, her hands and feet being stepped on, adding insult to injury and even more pain. It may cost you to get to him. But there's only one in the crowd he looked at that day and said, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Your whole of your blood issue has been changed. Amen. Let's one last time lift our hands to the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Master. God, you're so, so, so unbelievably good to us. God, I pray that you would move in the situations of lives of people in this building today, the hurting, the broken, the discouraged, the disillusioned, the disappointed, the depressed. You can do it today, God. You can do it today. Help us today, Jesus. Help us today. Please remember to keep praying for all those that are still Sick, Sister Kennedy, Sister Gray, Sister Butts, Brother Yarborough, Brother Crawford is not feeling well. There's a long list, I promise you. But we're praying and we're seeing God answer prayer. We're watching God do it. We're going to keep trusting Him, believing Him. God bless you. Make this week count. Whatever you do, make it count. Our time is short. Our days left to work and labor for Him, so let's make sure we're giving our best. God bless you. Pray that God's best happens in your life today.